Hey guys, it's Miss Levy, and we're here to review 10.2, the types of subsistence agriculture. Um, let's take a look at each type. So let's start here with shifting cultivation, which is also called slash and burn farming. So this is located in the Amazon of South America, the rainforest of Central and West Africa, and the rainforest of Southeast Asia. So this is in the humid low latitude climate zone. So in the rainforest specifically along the equator, and it's typically practiced by indigenous groups, so by native groups. Usually the people who are practicing this, they don't own the land that they're practicing this on. So this puts them in conflict with the people who do own the land. Sometimes it's the government, sometimes it is um, farmers or settlers and such. So there are four steps to this process, this shifting cultivation. Just in the name, we know shifting means move. So this is farming and involves moving. Slash and burn tells us that it involves slash and burn as well. So the four steps. First, they slash. So they cut down the vegetation. Remember, they're coming into thick rainforest. So you can't farm in the rainforest. You have to clear it out to, to make a field. So they, they slash, they cut down the vegetation first. Then they burn to remove the rest of the vegetation. Then they plant, they farm. They work that land hard. They work it intensively. And they work it so intensively that it tends to lead to soil erosion and depletion of the nutrients to where they can no longer um, plant there anymore. So they move to new land and they repeat. They may come back after some time because they've overused the soil. So they leave that land fallow. Fallow means they leave it unplanted. They leave it alone. Um, to replenish. So again, four steps to that. They slash, then they burn, then they plant, they farm on it, and then they move and repeat. Next, um, so slash and burn farming, this did work in the past. Historically, it was much more sustainable because we had smaller populations and more land available, but it's expected to diminish in the 21st century um, because of improved technology. So we have higher yields which means we have more food, which means you need there's less need for this shifting cultivation. Because of the green revolution, they have better seeds and better practices, so therefore make more stable food and therefore less need for shifting cultivation. This is also expected to diminish in the, in the 21st century because of growing populations. This means that there is less land available to do this because this requires a lot of land. You figure they're, they're constantly... Um, clearing out more land and burning it and farming it and then moving. And this can be years, seven years or so, before they return to land that they would previously have used. And so this growing population, there's less land available. Um, there's it's poor soil due to the overuse, and it just cannot sustain. This land cannot sustain this growing population with these practices. In addition, it will diminish in the 21st century because of the introduction of commercial agriculture. So this is like the opportunity cost. So what else could they be doing with that land instead? Well, they could be doing commercial agriculture. And the, the people who do own that land um, will want to make money. Commercial agriculture is more effective and more efficient, meaning that they can produce more. Um, and so this is a better use of the land. And oftentimes they will switch to plantation farming and they'll take over this land. So this is a money-making endeavor. Um, in addition, it's expected to diminish in the 21st century because of competition for land use. Um, and so they're going to lose out because of the inefficiency of the use of the land. So um, groups like loggers, uh, commercial, agriculture, com commercial agriculture, ranching, and settlements want to use this land and said so the government actually takes away the land makes them stop and now they cannot use it again this puts the government at odds with a lot of indigenous groups this is very controversial especially in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil because this is part of the folk culture they've sustained themselves for generations um, using this land. So finally, this does bring us to the government environmental protection is the last reason why it's expected to diminish in the 21st century because the government will not let them practice this anymore because it's just unsustainable. They want to limit deforestation because they're cutting down the rainforest and they're trying to limit the damage to the environment. 
So again, to review those reasons why it's going to diminish in the 21st century is because of improved technology like higher yields and the green revolution, bringing better seeds, more stable food supply. Growing population means there's less available land that cannot sustain. There's poor soil quality because of the introduction of commercial agriculture, which is just a better use of the land. They can use it to actually make money. Competition for this land used by loggers and commercial agriculture um, ranching settlements that will take away the land so they cannot use it. And finally, the government and environmental protection groups uh, will not let them practice this anymore, and they limit the deforestation, um, try to limit the damage to the environment. Again, this puts all these groups at odds with these indigenous native groups who their folk culture for generations have depended upon this. Next, let's talk about pastoral nomadism. Nomad meaning moving around, pastoral is animals. So this is the herding of domesticated animals. This is mainly in North Africa, Southwest Asia, and Central Asia. Um, this is in dry climate, so arid and semi-arid climate zones. So the problem with this is that you, this is sustaining 15 million people. There are over 6 billion people, 7 billion people on the planet. And this is only sustaining 15 million people but it's taking up 20% of the earth's land. These people depend on their herd to survive. Typically they move around with the seasons, um, so wherever they can gain sustained food and water for their animals. Again, this is part of the tradition, their folk culture. Oftentimes this is transhumanance, which is the seasonal migration of the livestock between the mountains and the lowland pastures. Again, this is again for climate, water, and food for their animals. This causes significant conflict between the herders, the pastoral nomads, the farmers, the land over, landowners, and the government over land use. This has caused a lot of wars, especially in northern Africa and places like Sudan. This was at the root of the war in Sudan and one of the reasons why South Sudan split away. Next is intensive subsistence. Remember, subsistence agriculture, um, they are... Um, they are, this is agriculture for the farmer to consume. Intensive means they work the land really hard all the time. It's very labor intensive, so it requires a lot of manpower, and they usually do this by hand or with primitive tools. The difference in intensive subsistence is do they grow rice or not? And it's practiced by the largest percentage of people in the world because it's the primary um, type of agriculture practiced in South. Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. And we know these are, um, in terms of population, the largest countries in the world are in South Asia, India, East Asia, China, and Southeast Asia. This would be Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand. Um, this would be in Indonesia, Philippines as well. So again, intensive subsistence, do they grow rice or not? So let's talk about intensive subsistence, wet rice dominant. This means they grow rice. Wet rice means that they have the seeds on dry land. So they start out on dry land and then they transfer the seedlings to flooded fields. This is what I meant by it being very labor intensive. This is practiced in Southeast Asia, Southeast China, and East India. You'll notice that these are areas where rice is a staple in the diet. Southeast Asia, Southeast China, and East India because this is what grew there. They need the climate with rain and, and for it to be warm. So this is in tropical, humid, low latitude or warm, mid latitude climates because obviously you need flooded fields. How do you get that? That's with rain. Um, this is why they depend so heavily on the monsoons on the coasts of India because they need that rain in order to grow the rice. There are several steps to this process. So they start with plowing the field, then they flood the field, which is called the sawa, and then they transfer the seedlings to the flooded field, and then they harvest it by hand literally by hand. And we'll look at some pictures of what this actually looks like and you think about harvesting this by hand. Sometimes they can use double cropping. That means that they do intensive land use and labor and they can maybe get two harvests per year per year per field. Excuse me, two harvests per year per field if they're lucky. This is feast or famine, so in times of drought when the water doesn't come, the rains don't come. Um, they, they have significant problems with food sources. This has significant environmental impact, intensive subsistence, wet rice dominant. 
You have habitat loss because they're destroying land. You have a decrease in the water quality um, because they are contaminating um, the water with uh, whatever um, pollutants and such they're using. This does increase wetlands, but it does change the habitat there. It does lead to increases of diseases like malaria because of the standing water. It brings mosquitoes. It can improve soil quality because you have so much water there, um, but it does lead to decreased air quality because they do burn um, the fields at some point. Next, so let's take a look at what rice looks like. So this is the sawa, the flooded field. You see the seedlings in there. I want you to remember that they transfer these seedlings by hand. This is terrace farming. This would probably be in a place like Indonesia, in Bali maybe. And you can see here, they carve this out up a hillside and they plant on this flat surface that they've carved out. This is called the terrace. This is what rice looks like whenever it's almost ready to harvest. And this one I said by hand. The rice is inside. They crack that open and then they let the, it, um, the, the, it blow away in the breeze and the rice is on the inside of this. Very labor intensive. Next, let's talk about intensive subsistence wet rice not dominant. This means that they do not grow rice. It is still very labor intensive, but they don't grow rice because of the different climate. This is in the interior of India, in northern China, and the interior of Southeast Asia, where you don't get that heavy rainfall that comes with the rain monsoons or the heavy storms. It's still intensive land use, and it's still very intensive labor. Um, they work that land really hard. It's hard work. Um, this is in the climates of cold mid-latitude or dry climates. So there's not enough rain to grow rice. They mainly grow wheat but they will also grow barley and, and millet. And so this is on a crop rotation sometimes, some years. They may have a more mild crop climate. Um, so it's different, depends on the crop to crop each year or the season to avoid soil depletion. So it really depends on what that soil um, and what the climate looks like for the year. This is wheat and this is millet. You can see that here's wheat. This is wheat that's going to be ready to be harvested soon. You can see that here is the little, these are the little pieces of wheat right there. If you look right there, this is where the wheat comes out is here. Wheat is also pretty labor intensive if you don't have like a combine to cut it and thrash it. This is millet, which is another grain. This is what millet looks like whenever it's near to um, be ready to be harvested. The millet is here on this long stalk. Again, these the, we talked about that eating for pleasure is a luxury that you find in wealthier societies. Um, in LDCs and DCs, most of the people are eating for sustenance, just to sustain, um, just to survive. So, so many of them rely mainly on the grains. There are many people in this world that the only meals they have throughout the day are their grains, whether it be the wheat, the millet, the barley that's available in these climate zones in these areas, or it's the rice that's available in the other. So this concludes our um, presentation here about the review of the different types of subsistence agriculture. Again, we had shifting cultivation, pastoral nomadism, intensive subsistence wet rice dominant, and intensive subsistence wet rice not dominant.